Good morning and welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We are joined today by Karen Tumblety, who is the deputy editorial page editor for the Washington Post, a columnist, author of a brilliant biography of Nancy Reagan. Thanks for coming back on the, the podcast, Karen. Oh, thanks so much for having me again. All right. So let's get in the mood. But before, before we dive into all of the other dysfunction, before we have to actually take the crazy pills, yesterday, uh, three billion people had to cope with their own lives when Facebook and all of its associated apps went down for several hours. So there was this great silence that settled across the world. And in my newsletter this morning, I, I kind of speculated, you know, is it possible that, you know, that we were a kinder, gentler, less stupid nation for a few hours? But um, it got me thinking about this. So let's let let's let's start here. Imagine there's no Facebook. It's easy if you try. It, it is. It is easy. Imagine all the people missing face to face. You. Amazing. Imagine no likes, no comments, no statuses to write. Imagine people having conversations, making eye contact, maybe possibly theoretically reading a book. So I guess, Karen, were, were we for a brief time better off without Facebook? I don't know where you come down on Facebook. Well, I must say it didn't didn't really affect my life any, uh, having it down. Uh you know, and, and I, I think that the timing of it is so interesting, given that this is not going to be Facebook's happiest week ever. No, it's not going to be its happiest week ever, as we find out from the whistleblower, uh, the way it uses its algorithm. And again, uh, n- not actually something that we didn't already suspect, that that Facebook pumps this sludge out through its algorithms, because that's how they get the most eyeball time. That's how they get the most clicks, and that's how they make their money. But, you know, I just, you know, I, I just kind of remember that strange calmness that briefly settled over America when, when Donald Trump's Twitter account uh, was, was taken away. And I'm just was thinking about what eight hours of no vaccine disinformation, no, you know, no, none of the normal back and forth, uh, you know, look at, look at my, my new nails commentary might have done to the country. I, I I have a hard time not not thinking that that in 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 some areas it it forced people to do things that they haven't done in a long time like I don't know if they maybe think for themselves. Well, the other thing is, and and I think the you know the whistleblower, and it's funny. I I've never you know the the idea that this person is being called a whistleblower also tells you the degree to which Facebook has practically become a public utility. Um, but I. One of the the points she made, which I guess we all kind of knew intuitively, is that Facebook sort of likes to say that its algorithm is designed to promote meaningful engagement. But what really gets people going is anger. Yeah. And um, the the degree to which it stokes rage in this country, which, by the way, is not something that is in short supply in America right now, too, I think, you know, occasionally it might be nice to just sort of turn it off and decide what we think for ourselves. Yeah, not, I don't know that it actually happened, but, you know, you can dream. All right. So, Karen, you're you're also a history buff. Um, I, I have to admit that I was shocked yesterday uh, to learn that uh, you you know the famous Winston Churchill comment: Americans can always be counted on to do the right thing after they've exhausted all the other possibilities. Yes. I was I was shocked to learn that Winston Churchill never actually said that. You're kidding? No, um, there's a lot of different versions. You can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. It turns out that it wasn't Churchill, and it may it's bogus attribution. It may have been you know, Abba Iban, uh, the Israeli politician and diplomat who probably most people listening don't remember. Um, so I, this was new to me that he didn't say that. But I, I, I looked it up because I was going to make a snarky comment that Winston Churchill had obviously never met Mitch McConnell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, we're going to do the right. So help me out here. We, we, we are once again moving closer to this debt train wreck. He's refusing to raise the, the debt limit. 
And the interesting question, of course, is, is, is what, what does Mitch McConnell actually want? And according to this New York Times story that I'm looking at right now, basically nothing and chaos. Let me just read two paragraphs. Two weeks before a potentially catastrophic default, McConnell has yet to reveal what he wants, telling President Biden in a letter on Monday, we have no list of demands, so nothing. Instead, he appears to want to sow political chaos for Democrats while insulating himself and other Republicans from an issue that has the potential to divide them. So this is the politics of nihilism, isn't it, Karen? What? How is it going to end? Well, it's 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 going to end with. I mean, the debt ceiling is gonna is gonna pass, but it, it brings sure. us back to why do we go through this exercise? This is you know, this is money that's already been spent. I mean, if there's going to be a debt ceiling vote, they ought to they ought to put it up before they spend the money, not after it. It is. It, I mean, this this whole exercise of raising the debt ceiling is completely pointless, it is. and um, it just it just gives each party an opportunity to knock the other over the head. Uh, in that letter that Mitch McConnell sent to President Biden, he did he did have a reminder that Biden himself had had voted this uh, this way several times when the, it was the Republicans' responsibility to uh, to raise the debt ceiling. It's just a completely pointless exercise. It is completely pointless. It is completely artificial. It's completely optional. And, you know, you think back on, I mean, let's imagine a future historian looking back on the great crash of 2021 when the economy was tanked, tanked and the looked like America was going to default on its debt, trying to explain to a classroom of history students that this was completely self-inflicted. This was completely artificial. They just sort of made up this debt ceiling thing. And that you had one political party that basically said, yes, we can run up the deficit by seven trillion dollars. But then when it comes time to actually pay it, nah, we figure we could screw the other party. I mean, that's what that's what makes. And I'm, I'm sorry, I always, as you know, struggle against deep cynicism. But this is one of those moments where it's it's the games politicians play for no particular reason other than the game itself. But also, you know, Mitch McConnell saying, I don't really I'm not looking to, for a deal here. I, I'm skeptical of that, number one. And I'm also wondering if it comes, he's just basically trying to get them to roll this thing into whatever big reconciliation bill Fine. they come up with. But if the Democrats don't do that and we get to a point where it is just a vote up or down on the debt ceiling, not attached to anything else, I do wonder if McConnell will release a few of his less crazy members of his caucus, you know, a few Mitt Romney types to to go ahead and say, yeah, let's not, you know, risk the credit rating of this entire country and, and potentially plunge it into default over this, over this completely ridiculous, pointless uh, you know, so what you, you mentioned the Mitt Romney's and the non crazy Republicans, and believe it or not, there are some non crazy Republicans. Why are they going along with this right now? Okay, so I get, I get Mitch McConnell. I mean, I get some of the the the, the MAGA types, but why? What is your sense why they're going along with this at this point? Because Mitt Romney clearly does not want the country to default, and yet, you know, this is his job to vote yes or no on this, and he's voted no. So what's going through his head? I think that it's because it's we're not up to the crisis point. The other big the other thing, the other truism of Washington is that until you're right up against this deadline, there's really no incentive for anybody to move. So I, I really do think, you know, some, something is going to happen at the end. Are you really sure? Uh, I, yeah, I, I mean, one, I mean, I'm yeah. sure. Okay, so that that's that is the default position, and and I, and I and I agree with you, except that, you know, how many times have we had the conversation? Well, that won't happen. Well, they won't try that. Well, that's not going to happen because it's inconceivable. And then, of course, we have Donald Trump in the Oval Office, and may have him again in the Oval Office. So, I just I just wondered. This is, of course, the the danger in a game of chicken where you have two cars driving very rapidly toward one another that you just assume that somebody's going to swerve out of the way because um, the alternative is so terrible. But every once in a while, nobody swerves and 
you have a fiery crash. So I, I look, I, I'm, 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 I'm hoping you're right. Now, speaking of game and chicken. Oh, and by the way, but this oh, yeah, is the sure. kind of fiery crash we we've never really had before. Is a default on the country's no, debt. I, no, I, I'm, I'm, I am, I am with you. It's just that, I guess the 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 assumption that that rational people will rule the day just seems a little shakier. And I just, I just I, that's why I'm just throwing it out there. So. <laughs> Let's uh, speak of the other game of political chicken. We have these. Uh, we have the whole Biden agenda and everything, and the um, all of the focus on Kirsten Cinema. See, I, I, this is what what really am- amazed me last night. And I I had some thoughts on this, and I don't know Tom Nichols and I had some thoughts on this last night. That you have all of this going on. You have this slow rolling coup. You have Steve Bannon talking about shock troops. I'll play you that sound bite in a, in, a, in a moment. You have the debt issue. All of this. And last night, all the red hot passion on Democrat social media was beating up on Kirsten Cinema and explaining why it was OK for activists to follow her into the bathroom while filming and berating her. So I, g- give me your, your sense right now, because it just strikes me that that is um, not a productive, not a persuasive strategy on the part of the activists. I understand their frustration, but it's a 50 50 Senate and they quite literally need her vote for everything. She, she in her person, represents the Democratic majority. She pulls a Jim Jeffords, and you got Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. So give me, give me your take on Kirsten Sinema and uh, what's going on right now. Well, first of all, number one, following somebody into the bathroom is not exactly a persuasive tactic yeah. if you are trying to get People to look at your arguments and say, "Hey, I want to be—I want to be part of these guys." Um, but the the other thing is, Kirsten Cinema, at least the most recent numbers that I have looked at, she's pretty popular back in Arizona, uh, and she comes from a pretty conservative state by and large. Um, I, I do think what's frustrating people is, unlike Manchin, she has not publicly given any sense of what her parameters are for a deal. Now, she has claimed that she's doing it privately. I, I do not know if that is true. But, um, you know, again, this thing's going to have to play out. And I think in the end, they get a deal. And I think if Manchin comes up with some kind of number on this reconciliation package, the big social spending that that he can go with, I personally would be very surprised if Cinema hangs out there by herself. Yeah, that would be unlikely. Um, and that, that's what makes me so skeptical. I'm I'm dialing down my language from Twitter here um, of the let's let's har- let's harass and insult her, um, you know, as, mu- as much as possible, because you could imagine her getting her back up. Um, you know, the, she is from the state of Arizona, and I can't help but think that everybody admired John McCain's independence. He was a maverick. Right. Um, and Kirsten Cinema is being portrayed as something very, very different. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not carrying water for her. But can I just say something? And I want to bounce this off you because I, I am as a um, designated um, throughout social media as an old white guy who should not have opinions on a variety of things. I mean, you know, I, I, I get I get the, the tweets you know, saying you should sit this one out. No one wants to hear from you. But I, can I just offer an opinion on this as, as an old white guy? Go ahead. I am blown away by what it looks even to me like the overt sexism of the attacks and the assaults coming from the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. I mean, the mockery, the attacks on her, the fact that they are going after her in a way that they would not ever go after. I'm sorry, Joe, Joe Manchin. I mean, there is something. Am I am I missing something? Am I picking up something? Because I'm watching the pictures that are being posted, and the, the memes that are out there, the narratives, the way she's being described. And I just wonder, do you people ever listen to yourselves? Do you look in the mirror? I mean, I'm an old white guy from the Midwest, and I'm going, this is pretty damn sexist. Well, the other thing, I, I was in Arizona as she was running for the Senate in 2018, and she really, she is behaving exactly the way she promised she huh. would behave. You know, that was a big part of her campaign was, you know, I, I'm not going to be a rubber stamp for anybody. Now, again, it's, a, you know, I wonder if people in Arizona get tired of this stance on her part. 
uh, I mean, the thing is, John McCain was a maverick, but he was a maverick with a, a record of many, many decades that you could go back and look at. Um, she's more of a blank slate. You know, she started out in the Green Party, but I agree. I mean, the, the degree to which people talk about, well, look at how she dresses, you know, or whatever. Um, it, it, I do think she is. It, there is a there is a an underpinning of sexism here. Yeah, remember dangerous creature. Remember the dangerous creature sweater she wore. Right. She wore. She presided over the Senate wearing a sweater that said "dangerous creature." Look, I, this is this is a woman who, you know, quite frankly, may be all out of bleeps to give if you push her too hard. I, I, I'm just, I am just saying that. So, so give me your sense. You know, there's uh, obviously the narrative that we've had for the last uh, two weeks has been Democrats in disarray. It's an old, it's a popular narrative. Uh, it seems to be quite accurate right now. Um, and it comes at a moment when Joe Biden seems vulnerable. He's been dropping in the polls. So give me your sense of what is the state of the Biden presidency right now? Um, he's clearly dropped into some negative zone, but recoverable, dangerous, what? What did you um, think? I think, first of all, I think there's a deal here. I think they're going to get to it. Um, it we already kind of know what it's going to look like. It's, it's going to, they're going to get this hard infrastructure bill passed. They're going to pass a smaller uh, social spending reconciliation bill and, you know, once once they do that, uh, I think people, all the messiness that goes into it tends to fade pretty quickly when you actually get something done. Now, I do think that there are other things that are dogging Biden. The, the you know, chaos that accompanied the mm -hmm. Afghan pullout, the fact that we cannot seem to get COVID behind us. Mm -hmm. I think those kinds of things are going to matter a lot more going into 2022 than, uh, you know, this few week period where it looked like people couldn't agree on anything. The other thing that, you know, I hope they don't do is get to a deal with a bunch of the gimmicks in the numbers, uh, you know, oh, let's make this a five-year bill instead of a 10-year bill. But, but, of course, but of course they will, of course, because they always do, right? But the, but there are yeah. some things they should do. Some of these yeah. programs should be means-tested more than they are. Um, you know, I, I think that I am of the, you know, school that it's it's better to do fewer things that are really well designed yes. and carefully mm -hmm. thought out than just sort of, you know, okay. So like what, too like, many directions what, what would, what would you prioritize if you're sitting in the room and you're, you're circling what you can put in there? Do you start with things like the child credit? Uh, do you start with climate change? Do you start with family leave? Where do you, what, what should the priorities be? I think, think it's climate change has to be a big one. And I think the, it, things that help children have to be a high priority. Um, things like dental care for Medicare, that's where you really ought to be looking at something that means tests. Um, because the fact is that the old older cohort of our population is also the most wealthy cohort of our population. So you know, I don't think that like all people over 65 ought to be getting, you know, dental dental benefits mm -hmm. and, and not having to pay for them. Uh, I think that you'd be better off uh, rather than giving everybody free community college. I don't, you ought to work on putting the money into Pell Grants and and directing it to, you know, the, the students who really, really need the help. So I, I, I think that if the deal doesn't go through, it really is a blow to the Biden presidency. I'm not convinced that even a successful bill, however, is going to turn things around. Because I'm, I'm just not sure that that uh, he gets the credit, the Democrats get the credit for those checks and, and that spending. So let's just step back a little bit on the, the challenges that Joe Biden is facing. Uh, it's not just Dems in disarray. It's you have the, the, the hangover from Afghanistan. You have uh, you have COVID, as you mentioned. You have the ongoing crisis at the border, and he's being hit from both sides on that. You have, um, you know, lingering concerns about uh, urban crime, which you know 
that Republicans are going to be exploiting. And then, of course, you you have just the ongoing question, you know, Joe Biden is old. Is, 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 that, is that an issue? Is that something that's in the minds of voters out there? It, it seems to be showing up in a lot of the focus groups that I've been hearing about. So yeah, know, I've it, actually it, been... it, stri- it strikes me that he's got that he's, he's got some some serious headwinds. Yeah, I, I agree. I've actually been sitting in on focus groups lately, and I'm surprised. And, and I'm talking about focus groups of swing voters, uh, white suburban women. Uh, and I do, I'm surprised at how often these concerns about Biden yeah. seem to be popping up. Um, I, But again, I just think, first of all, there's a lot of time between now and November of 2022 and if COVID is behind us, if the economy is coming back, uh, you know, a lot of these problems are going to seem not as they, in the rear view mirror, they, they're going to look different than they do in the windshield. I think this is one of the most important lessons that uh, that we've learned in the last few years is that um, people have short attention spans, they have short memories, and things change awfully fast. How many, how many times have we had the conversation, hey, remember six months ago, we thought, you know, X, Y, or Z was the big thing, and now you hardly even remember it. Okay, so let's take a deep breath here, Karen, um, because we now have the launch of MAGA again. You saw this, right? The the new the, the new post Corey Lewandowski super PAC headed by Pam Bondi and what Kim, Kimberly Guilfoyle, and they're calling it MAGA again. Uh, and I by, want to by talk the way, about, Charlie, how yeah. soon before Corey's back in the in in the orbit? Corey's been in, he's been out. Like, he always comes back to the he, Trump. He messed with the money. Yeah. He, you know, as I as I wrote last week, I mean, you know, you can fondle you can fondle thighs and you know grab you know bottoms and everything, but not when it comes to the donors. You can't not mess with the donors. So I don't know. Okay, so let's let's talk about what the the vibes we're getting from MAGA again in a minute. If you're a fan of this podcast or any of our other podcasts here at The Bulwark, I really think you're going to enjoy our newest edition. It's called The Focus Group, and it's hosted by our own Sarah Longwell. Maybe you've heard Sarah talk about these focus groups that she conducts, but now she's actually sharing real audio from the participants. It's a great show, and I know you're going to love it. Again, it's called The Focus Group with Sarah Longwell, and you can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and everywhere else you consume podcasts. Okay, we are back with Karen Tumulty, uh, columnist, deputy editorial page of the Washington Post, uh, author of the definitive biography of Nancy Reagan, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan. So the MAGA again, Trump is clearly running. He was talked out of announcing. Washington Post reported this, that people told him, don't announce, otherwise you'll own the midterms, right? But but he's running, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, if if, if he can stand on two feet in 2024, he's running. So, you know, one of the things that uh, there's an ongoing debate about uh, whether or not uh, we should have taken his attempts to overturn the election seriously, the the, the coup attempt. And I, I'm in the camp of people saying, look, they, the Eastman memo um, added to all of the other things that we learned, you know, ought to be a massive red flag. I mean, it, it didn't work this time, but this was a serious attempt. I mean, where do you come down on the rolling constitutional crisis? Because I'm by, I'm right there. What about you? I think the rolling constitutional crisis mm-hmm. is the existential question of our time. And the Eastman memo really uh, is horrifying because it does show that they, you know, they, they would come up with any kind of rationale they could. And the, you know, the, I, 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 you know, did not have Dan Quayle on my bingo card <laughs> as the savior of our democratic system. But we it really was a very few people sort of standing in the no. way of a gigantic effort. And 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 I think the Mike Pence thing was a closer call than maybe we had realized. I want to get to him in a moment. Okay, so since we're talking about this uh the attempt to overthrow the election, we've been talking about Arizona politics. I don't know whether uh, people have seen this ad uh, from a woman named Carrie Lake, who is the Trump back candidate for the state of Arizona. The significance of it is that Carrie Lake is running explicitly 
on a platform of overturning the election. She is saying that had she been the governor of Arizona, she would not have certified Joe Biden's win in Arizona. There's nothing subtle about it. There's nothing hidden about it. And here's a little bit of a soundbite, uh, Karen, from uh, Carrie Lake's new ad, because it gives you a sense of where MAGA politics is going as we go into the midterms. Here's Carrie Lake's ad. It's time to take a sledgehammer to the mainstream media's lies and propaganda. The corporate media establishment flat out lies to people. It's right out of a communist playbook. That's why I'm communist. stepping up to run for governor of Arizona to get us back on track. I'm ready to take a sledgehammer to the corrupt media to destroy the corrupt cronyism what? that's been in Arizona far too long and to take a sledgehammer to these weak border policies that are ruining our state. But I will never take a sledgehammer to that big, beautiful wall. Oh, for Christ's sake. Okay, so you, 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 a lot of sledgehammer stuff there. Sledgehammer. What exactly does the governor of Arizona, <laughs> what powers would she have to take a sledgehammer to the media? You know, that's what I was wondering. Okay, so of all of the problems, I'm trying to imagine your Arizona voters sitting there thinking, you know, here, here's a list of five problems in my life. And you turn on television and there's somebody saying, it's time you let me governor. I will take a sledgehammer to the media. <laughs> what does it mean? I mean, really? Uh, look, it's just sort of a word salad. I mean, maybe it's kind of like, you know, Mad Libs, MAGA Mad Libs, communist, wall, sledgehammer. But this is, this is, what, this is what we're up against, Karen. Yeah. Uh this is it. This is the future. This. <laughs> okay. So in case you think that she's an outlier, um, did you hear Steve Bannon the other day? Steve Bannon is absolutely, yeah, speaking of guys who've been, you know, at, you know, out and in and exiled. Remember when he was actually arrested on that Chinese billionaire's boat and he was in handcuffs and he, he got off um, under uh, one of the last minute Trump pardons, but he's, he's sort of back as one of the ringleaders of uh, MAGA again. And apparently he had uh, had a gathering at the with the, the GOP club on Capitol Hill. That's like a like an in place, right? Yeah. I mean, that's where all the, the, the cool Republicans hang out. The Capitol Hill Club, yes. Yeah. So and he, and he got together with a bunch of Republicans and gave them a pep talk about what they needed to do. And on his show or whatever the hell it is, he, he's describing what he said to them. Here it goes. I gave this talk to these appointees and here's what I said. We're winning big in 2022. We're going to win big in 2024. We need to get ready now, right? We control this country. we got to start acting like it. And one way we're going to act like it, we're not going to have 4,000 ready to go. We're going to have 20,000 ready to go, and we're going to pick the 4,000 best and the most ready in every single department. And that's when we really start to deconstruck the administrative state. That's talking of CPAC. And they're always oh, trying to destroy. No, 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 no. We're trying to get an FDA at works. We're trying to get a CDC at works. So, and then he goes on to talk about the shock troops. Um, look, this is... Can, wait, can we just yeah. back up? Sure, please. Yeah. Because, so, they had an FDA and a CDC at the outset of the COVID epidemic. And so, why didn't it work? Well, deep state. <laughs> Not enough loyalists. People who believed in things like masks and social distancing and everything. It's interesting that he mentioned those two first, right? But, you know, they, so, they did have four years. Well, look, they're they're already talking about, you know, the restoration, the 2024, the MAGA revenge tour. And I, and I guess I would put some of the stuff that's going on among the in the Democrats in this context, like people, you understand that if you F it up right now, if you blank the bed right now, you're not just going to get a, you know, S Speaker Kevin McCarthy, you're going to get a president. Donald Trump's second term, and you, and you are not going to like that second term. I mean, that second term is, you, you think the first term was, was, was bad? So, I mean, this is, this is a real, you want to talk about imminent threats, and I guess that's why opening up Twitter last night and seeing you know, all of the energy, like, let, let's beat the crap out of Kirsten Sinema, like, guys, really? You know? I mean, there's stuff going on at that beer hall in Munich. You got to pay attention to that. <laughs> uh, no, I I know I I I I feel the depth of that sigh there. I mean, I I, re I really do. So, have you been have you been following Stephanie Grisham's uh, 
latest uh, confessions, um, recantation. She's the press secretary who never held a press briefing. And she's out. She's pretty hardcore dishing now about how awful it was, how terrible it was, you know, what a second term would be like. I have very mixed feelings about the folks that were there and were the enablers and now are, you know, coming out and saying, I'm. You know, this is clearly a rehabilitation project on her part. But it also that doesn't mean she isn't telling the truth. And she she right. did say that, you know, again and again when she was in the White House, when somebody would come up with some truly, truly nutty radical idea, the answer would be, Oh, that's for the second term. Yeah, the second term where he doesn't have to run for re-election. You know, and, and going back to your point about the the small number of people that stood between us and really bad things. Um, the, the, the key to understanding the second term is that those people wouldn't be around anymore. I mean, leaving aside uh, what's happening at the state and the local levels, you, you know that a second term would be like the first, like, like the last year of the Trump presidency on steroids, to use a, a hackneyed phrase. So one of the guys, now help me with this, Karen, some of this stuff, I, I'm, I'm sorry, this is why I need the crazy pills. So one of the, the key players in this, which we, we referenced before, is Vice President Mike Pence. And apparently, um, and, and by the way, in real time, I didn't see this as a, a, even a remote possibility. But now we're learning that the president and his circle were really serious about getting Mike Pence to overturn the election, either to delay the certification of the electoral votes or to not count them or, or whatever. And Mike Pence apparently was at least listening to people like uh, John Aceman. I mean, he had to call uh, Dan Quayle to uh, to get advice. You know, Dan Quayle saying, no, you can't do this. This is nuts. It's crazy. You know, forget it. Um, but in the end, um, Mike Pence refused to do, for the very, very first time, refused to do what, uh, what Donald Trump uh, said. And some of us were inclined to say, hmm, okay, key moment, courageous moment, maybe some credit for Mike Pence. He paid a huge price for it. He's never going to be president, probably. You had the the rioters chanting, hang Mike Pence. But did you hear him last night? Here's Mike Pence. I know the media wants to distract from the Biden administration's failed agenda by focusing on one day in January. They want to use that one day wow. to try and demean uh, the, the, the character and intentions of 74 million Americans <sighs> who believed we could be strong again and prosperous again and supported our administration in 2016 and, and 2020. Karen. Ah, uh, January 6th. No biggie. I mean, no, they, you, were, you, they were looking for him. They were looking for him. He was there. I mean, how many, how many shows do we have to devote to? Hey, the memory hole. Here's some historical revisionism. But it's Mike freaking Pence. You know, he was the target of all of that. You could argue that January 6th was his finest moment. And now he is retrospectively saying, nah, you're just trying to demean those wonderful 74 million people who, by the way, you know, most of whom were not there trying to overthrow the government, but he's all in on this. Yeah. And, you know, Mike Pence has his own book coming out. I'm going to be really interested in seeing uh, whether that is revisionist or whether it gives us any insights that we didn't already have into what was going on. I give a spo- he, spoiler. He was there. I mean, he saw it. Well, look, I mean, you know, I don't I don't want to use the phrase Kool-Aid again because it's been used, but he's drinking the Kool-Aid. I mean, is there some kind of a, you know, is, is there some kind of a re-education camp they send these people to? I, I think that the audience is that he, I mean, I, I you've got to wonder if he really and truly thinks there's any chance that he could ever be president because... <laughs> I I just can't imagine that would be the case. But the fact is, you know, somebody who's been a conservative Republican his whole life is having to live with the fact that whenever his name is uttered in front of a Republican base audience, the reaction is booze. And so, you know. And this this is not going to change that. Yeah, that is that is true. I mean, I, you know, I. Like I said, I, I will be interested in seeing where he decides to land when his own book comes out. Well, he'll 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 land in, in probably the most disgraceful place possible. See, I, this again, 
it's, it's, it's hard for me to really fully understand because there are alternative paths. There are off ramps here. And Mike Pence, you know, if he was, if he had a sober and clear view of, of, of his political future, which is you're not going to get the Republican nomination ever, um, would be, okay, what are the alternative paths? Um, how about becoming a statesman? How about, you know, talking about uh, that moment of courage and building your brand around uh, that principled stand, that rare principled stand that you took. Instead, he's essentially crapping on his own moment. It's like, do you, really? Because you're going to, you know, what is, what is that quote about had to choose between honor and, I mean, he's, he's, he's going to get dishonor and, and defeat at the same time. You know, and that's, that seems very clear to me. So what is the motivation of these folks? I mean, let me put it this way. Isn't there a gene? I understand the power gene, the ambition gene. Isn't there also just an, you know, an impulse to say a little bit of self-respect? I am not going to demean myself. Well, it's, it's interesting to me too, that, that, I mean, he doesn't seem to worry about his place in history. None of them. The mark he will leave. Um, and it's, it's just mystifying because you're right. I mean, January 6th was his moment. Um, he, you know, he put out a principal letter in, you know, informing the president that he was going to have to open the envelopes and that was it because that was all the, his entire constitutional role. I mean, that, that was a moment where, you know, he, he finally split with Trump and he did something really honorable. So let me ask you an existential question. You're an historian. You've written um, a biography um, of, of Nancy Reagan. You've talked to people who obviously are concerned about their legacy. It does feel as if we're in a, an era where more and more people don't care about what history says about them. I, I'm thinking about, was it, uh, was it Bill Barr who was asked about, well, are you, con aren't you concerned about your legacy? And he said, yeah, I'll be dead soon. I don't really care. I don't know if this is a new thing, but it, it does seem as if we've moved from an era in which people were very concerned about how they would appear in history and be remembered by history to not caring anymore. Is, is, is that, is that possible? It's sad if, if that's the case, because you think of, I, I truly do believe that what brings most people into public service really is a belief and a commitment to making things better than they were when they got there. And of course, I mean, it is an old story to see how those, those, I, that idealism gets corrupted along the way, but just the speed with which it's happening is is perhaps i mean you said i mean people don't remember what even happened 30 minutes ago so may, maybe that's part of it i th i think it actually is and i really do think that they're going you know somebody will say well you know what will history say and people will say well you know nobody reads history anymore nobody will care or will be dead or you know it's that it it appears it, it this seems to be one of the shifts that we're seeing because you're right. I mean, there was a time when people would say, I I'm getting into public office because I want to make a difference. And then I will be concerned about what my legacy will be. Everybody was concerned about their legacy. We now seem to have an entire class of political actors who don't care about their legacy or figure, I'll worry about that later. I just have to stay alive right now. And if staying alive right now means you know, demeaning myself or, or truckling or, you know, pulling my forelock, I will do that. I, you know, I, I, I try not to have everything go back to Trumpism, but I do think that this is also Trumpism. I mean, Trump has been all about airbrushing his own record, uh, you know, right. marketing himself, that sort of thing. Um, I, I, sometimes wonder what the Donald Trump presidential library is going to actually look like. Well, this is the other thing, you know, we, we, we talk a lot about the, you know, alternative reality media ecosystems, but also maybe there's the belief that, look, you know, 
uh, my side will write my history. So Donald Trump is not concerned about what history will say because he figures, hey, I don't know, you know, Dinesh D'Souza will write a book about uh, about the Trump presidency or Victor Davis Hanson will write about the, the Trump presidency, you know, or I, I don't know, um, you know, Mark Thiessen will write a column about how I was an underrated president. You know, he, they have people who will write those books um, for them. And I don't know, was that was that true? In the past, I, I still, there's always been propagandists. I mean, I'm just trying to get a sense of of what's new and what's not, because it, it really is extraordinary to me watching Mike Pence not only not be concerned about his legacy, but trashing his own the one moment that could be the defining moment of his career, and it's like, yeah, that's all out of media hype. Yeah, it's really astonishing. It is. I'm just trying to work it out. I'm just trying to figure. Out. I, I have to get on a plane. And, and go and talk about, you know, how the right lost its mind. And, and I'm going to have to admit to them, you know, that I, I'm i still working on this. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I am still working on it because, and I know one of the things I'll say is that I had a very dark vision of the future. I, you know, I, I think I, I said at one point, whatever bad is happening will get worse, but I underestimated it. And even since January 6th, the kinds of developments, um, Watching uh, Republicans and conservatives embrace the the great replacement theory, that racist theory, watching the the anti-vax movement begin to to spread um, uh, the nihilism about about the debt. I mean, all of this seems to be accelerating. And I, I don't know where it ends. I, mean, I don't want I don't want to end on a dark note, which is why I wanted you to come on the, the podcast to give us the the brighter and uh, cheerier and more optimistic point of view. But I don't know where this ends. Well, I, I also don't know why they don't see this is a party that doesn't seem to understand the problem in the fact that they have won the popular vote in exactly yeah. one presidential election since 1988. Uh, and they don't seem to care. I know. And so, you know, at some point you've got to figure they've got, you know, their, their, their business model at this point seems to be preventing people from voting, which is also sort of a, a strange, you know, a strange game plan as well. Well, or preventing those votes that are cast from being counted, which I actually am a little bit more worried about. So tell me what you're thinking about these days. What are you keeping an eye on over the next week? What should we be watching? Oh gosh! Well, I'm for me. I'm actually kind of fascinated with all this stuff going on with Facebook up on the hill, uh, and watching how they how they respond to that. Like I said, I really do think the the thing that everybody in Washington's talking about, which is the you know the problems with Biden getting his agenda over the finish line, I just think that's going to work out, and um, I think I that it, it is going to be one of these stories that seems really big in the windshield and not so big in the rearview mirror. I certainly, certainly hope that you are right about this, but you have been right so often in the past so that I'll end on that positive note, okay? Uh, Karen Tumulty, thank you so much for coming back on the Bulwark Podcast. So great to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for listening to today. I'm Charlie Sykes. We'll be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again. <laughs>